Okay. I am Professor Yuki Terazawa from the History Department uh, at Hofstra University. I would like to uh, give you uh, an introductory remark to this event. Um, on February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 1966 with this about 120 than Japanese immigrants who had not been eligible to become a citizen, who we called Issei, and their American-born children, Nisei, were relocated to internment camps. Indeed, FBI had already um, been rounding up leaders of Japanese American community without due process. Uh, most of them were middle-aged um, or older is same man. Um, now, then, um, now all uh, um, the people of Japanese descent who resided in coastal areas of the Western states of the United States were to be incarcerated also without due process. They were ordered to relocate with each person carrying no more than two bags and then many families had to sell their houses, businesses, farms, valuable heirloom, uh, beautiful uh, Japanese uh, furniture, porcelain, uh, kimono, uh, hastily, or they needed to just throw them away. Since it took no more than two, or I mean, it took uh, actually more than two or three months to build camps inland far away from the coast. Um, they were first moved to the so-called assembly centers, uh, which were places such as racetracks, fairgrounds, uh, a facility that could house thousands of people. Uh, so many Japanese families stayed in unsanitary horse stables or um, such uh, temporarily horrible um, places for three months and using straw as mat mattresses. Um, and then, then um, they were moved to um, inland camps where some families stayed until the end of World War II. So this is my very brief introductory remark. remark. Um, and uh, Mr. Hasegawa is gonna talk about you know, his experience and more about the camps. Um, so why don't I uh, introduce uh, Mr. Hasegawa. Tom Hasegawa was born in 1938 in Los Angeles. Okay, so now I can actually um, share uh, the picture and then hope this works. Share. Um, so he, um, so he was born in Los Angeles in uh, 1938. His family was running a restaurant. Um, I believe this was a diner in Little Tokyo area, uh, catering mostly to white customers. After um, the issuance of this executive order, his family was relocated in a camp uh, in Chu Lake, in a first in assembly center, and then eventually to a camp in um, it's called Chu Lake in Northern California. After the end of World War II, uh, the family moved to Chicago and, and Mr. Hasegawa eventually received a college degree from the University of Chicago, majoring in biology. Having taught in uh, the state of Illinois for four years, he took a high school teaching job in Carmack High School. Uh, and then he taught there for 30 years until he retired. He has been a long time uh, member of the New York chapter of Japanese American Citizens League, JACL, a Japanese American group. And then he has given many public talks on this uh, experience um, of the internment. So we feel greatly honored that Mr. Hasegawa accepted our invitation to give a talk um, as a survivor at Hofstra University. Uh, on this note, I would like uh, to ask Mr. Hasegawa to start, please. So I'm gonna just uh, stop share. 
Oh, he's, uh, you know, Tom, you're muted. Please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, like I, you keep miss. Uh, my name is Tom Hasegawa, and uh, I just want to say that what I'm going to say is my personal opinion, and that uh, the experiences of other Japanese Americans may be quite different from mine because of our age when we went to the camp. But before I say my experiences during World War II, um, I want to sort of present a broad picture of why are we doing this? Why am I, you know, giving a talk on the Japanese American? Is it something that's a, a unique experience to a, to a, a certain group of Americans? Or is it a continuum of, of how America developed over the Anglo-Saxons, and um, they came over and uh, settled uh, here on the East Coast. And then um, gradually what happened is um, there were other immigrants that came, uh, especially after the Civil War. The Civil War had caused a lot of uh, uh, people to die, and we needed the manpower because the, this whole continent was open. And as a consequence, uh, the, uh, uh, we needed immigrants. And of course, uh, there was a, uh, this idea of who is an American and who's not an American, the idea of us and them. Well, the us at the beginning were the Anglo-Saxons, you know, the wasp, white, uh, Anglo-Saxons, and uh, they were the dominant uh, people here. And uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, they ruled the country, the government, and so on. But after the Civil War, there was a lot of immigrations uh, from uh, other parts of Europe, such as Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, and so on. As they uh, flooded into the uh, United States, uh, you know, there was a lot of racial and uh, ethnic uh, prejudices against them because they were not, you know, the Northern Europeans. The, the uh, us were mostly Northern Europeans. And as a consequence, uh, you know, the, uh, there was a lot of prejudice. And I'm sure that most of you know that there was a lot of prejudice, prejudices against people of Irish descent mainly because of the religion and others from the South because of the fact that they were not as white as the people up North in, in Northern Europe and so on. But gradually as they sort of like uh, became uh, integrated and the second and third generation learned English, they were accepted into the United States population and the us included uh, those people. And uh, even today, there is some discrimination against even those people because, you know, some of these people uh, still suffer slight uh, prejudices, especially people like uh, the Jewish people who are, because of the fact that they're not Christians, you know, we still see anti-Semitism uh, that is prevalent. Now, one big idea about that evolved in the 19th century was this uh, idea of manifest destiny. The fact that, that God had given the people from Europe, especially the North, the people from, from Northern Europe to, to actually, uh, they were the chosen people to, 
to expand and and uh, from the east coast all the way to the west coast it was it was the destiny uh, that was presented in uh, by maybe by by religious order that they were able to do that now this caused a lot of uh, hardship for the native population at the beginning the native populations were able to uh, uh, agree with you know uh, treaties and so on but this was soon you know broken and and uh, the the native americans were not considered uh, you know part of us you know they were a separate group and so on and then this idea of white supremacy was very dominant this is a dark chapter in american history and this dark chapter evolved, especially uh, among uh, the slaves that were brought over from Africa, the uh, Mexicans from the South, and of course on the West Coast, the uh, this uh, prejudice against uh, uh, race, other people of races, races were uh, especially among the uh, Asian people. The Chinese were the first to come to the United States uh, and uh, they were invited at the beginning because we were expanding, America was expanding and, uh, and we needed a railroad that, that crisscrossed the United States. The Chinese were very, very hard workers and they, they came to develop the, the railroads through the Rocky Mountains, which was very, very hard work tremendous amounts of, uh, of labor was needed and so on. It's interesting to know that in the uh, 19th century, when the railroad from the East and the railroad from the West joined together somewhere in the West, I think in Utah or someplace, and they had a big celebration. And if you ever take a look at the photograph of that celebration where the East Railroad and the West Railroad from California met, guess what? There's, you don't see any evidences of the, of the Chinese who helped build that railroad. This shows that there was a latent, and well, not latent, but actually obvious prejudice against these Chinese. One of the things that the, the Chinese uh, uh, the problem with the Chinese uh, that came over was that the United States was eager to, to get their labor, but they didn't want the women folks and the family to come over. So by the time the Chinese finished the railroads, they were eager to, you know, start a family. But the laws in, in the United States was, was very, very firm in terms of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of not bringing over the uh, women. And as a consequence, uh, many of the Chinese who had immigrated to the United States uh, left and went back to China because they wanted to start a family. And uh, as a consequence uh, of that loss of labor in California especially, and in the Western states, a lot of the farmers uh, were uh, had no labor to uh, harvest the crops and as a consequence uh, what happened was that uh, uh, the government uh, the people the farmers uh, petitioned the government uh, to to uh, actually get more people from other countries and so the united states government went to japan japan had a policy no immigration unless you know you uh, you had special papers and and most of the people did not immigrate to the United States, but by a treaty uh, that was signed uh, they uh, they were able to immigrate, especially farmers from the southern part of japan and so by agreement they the Japanese government says, "Well, we know how you uh, treated the Chinese." We want you to uh, not prejudice against women coming over here too. So, so uh, in the late 19th century, the uh, the people uh, from Japan were were able to migrate first to Hawaii and then to California. 
And so they started to come here in, you know, uh, in the thousands and, uh, and they started uh, labors. As long as they were, you know, subservient to the white farmers, every, everything was fine. Except of course, you know, as every immigrant group, they wanted to, you know, start their own farms. And so they, uh, they weren't able to vote. That's a very main uh, a prejudice that was from the very beginning. European settlers were able to vote after coming here and learning the, the English language. But the, for the people from the East, from China, the Philippines, and, the, uh, and, and Japan, they were, even though you, you stayed here a lifetime, there was no way to get naturalized into citizenship. Well, the, the Japanese started to, uh, to buy, uh, actually rent out first and then buy later on uh, land that was marginal. And the, because they were expert farmers, they started uh, um, uh, farms in, in, uh, in California. And uh, one of the ways they got away with the, with the purchase of land was that as they got children, they registered the name of the land in terms of their children. And the children were considered an American citizenship because of the fact that they were born here. And so as uh, by the 1930s, there were 50% uh, of the green crop in California was, uh, uh, was actually produced by Japanese farmers in California. Well, you can see what happened to uh, the, uh, the attitudes of the white farmers there. They had this idea of the fact that America was not a land for other people, especially of other races, that this is America is a white country. And so they, uh, they, they, there were all kinds of, uh, of propaganda to get rid of these, uh, these, uh, uh, these people uh, that came from the East, especially the Japanese, that they became more and more major uh, threat to the white farmers and also the fishermen that, that, uh, that were in the uh, Oregon and Washington state. In fact, this uh, uh, idea of, uh, of the white supremacy was, was so prevalent that newspapers, especially the Hearst newspaper in California, was very, very discriminatory towards uh, uh, the Japanese people. They would, uh, you know, say, oh, this is where we have a yellow pearl uh, that's coming out of the East and they're going to take over the country we got to stop this and so on. It was a, a tremendous amount. This is before Pearl Harbor that you had all these things and uh, that, uh, that were occurring. And as a consequence, uh, uh, people like Earl Warren, who, was, who became later on the Chief Justice of the United States, he was one of the principal people who, who actually was very anti-Japanese uh, as Attorney General in uh, in California. So, so all along the way, from the top of the government to the newspapers and the people, the farmers and so on, they were against uh, people like uh, the Japanese uh, coming to the United States. So this is an extension of this idea of white supremacy that was very, very prevalent in the United States. Well, as you can see, uh, when Pearl Harbor occurred, of course, this, uh, you know, uh, was the uh, uh, sort of like the catalyst for, for the uh, removal of, uh, of Japanese uh, from the whole Western areas. They wanted to get rid of them and uh, get rid of the competition and so on. And uh, as a consequence, uh, what happened is that under the disguise of military uh, uh, necessity, uh, they were uh, able to uh, 
get that done. And of course, uh, as you know, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was, uh, was instrumental, uh, especially since he wanted the votes of all these politicians uh, uh, in uh, California uh, to, to have them vote for his fourth uh, 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 year of presidency. And so as a consequence, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, order was sent out, uh, Executive Order 9066 was ordered. But there was a, a lot of resistance against this because people don't know it, but even Eleanor Roosevelt, his wife, says this is not necessary. You don't have to, these people are, you know, uh, are good people and why should we remove them? You know, we don't remove the Germans and the, excuse me. We don't remove the Germans and the Italians who are also part of the, the Axis power. And uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, you know, uh, this was the, the removal of Japanese Americans from the West Coast was this long chain that, of, of discrimination against uh, other races and so on that, that pervaded uh, throughout the history of uh, American America. And, uh, and as a consequence, uh, this led to the removal of uh, the Japanese Americans uh, uh, from the West Coast into desolate camps in the interior part of the United States. So that's a little history of, of, of why this occurred. And, and, and I want to tell this because it doesn't, this idea of uh, that happened uh, to us as Japanese Americans is not something that is isolated and something that was uh, uh, today. Today, actually, all of these incidences uh, that have occurred over the history of uh, America is, is, exists even today. The idea of Black Lives Matter is, is very, very uh, pertinent uh, to this idea uh, that, you know, this is uh, America is a white country. The supremacy of the white race is very, very important. And with the election of the last uh, president, this idea of, of uh, white supremacy uh, took on a stronger meaning. And, and so we have to be very cautious that this is not something that occurred in the past and, and we should forget about it. It's something that is a continuum that existed all the way from the colonial days with the, uh, with the settlement of the, of the continent to even today. And so uh, from then on, uh, I want to tell you that we also had this, uh, this idea of removal and uh, uh, without cause of uh, certain people, uh, such as uh, the Muslims uh, uh, and the Mexicans uh, and the uh, Central Americans, they come in and, and then we, we put them in camps and, uh, you know, we, we don't care about the human rights. These are all parts of this long continuum of, uh, of, uh, of things that have occurred in our history and we have to be very cautious. So. So the idea of what happened to us as Japanese Americans is still very, very much uh, relevant today as it was, let's say, in the 1940s uh, that when that occurred. So from that sort of uh, narrative, I want to tell you a little bit about what happened to our family. As, uh, as your teacher had said that uh, the uh, uh, I was born in Los Angeles, and uh, my um, <clears throat> my parents. Well, my mother actually came to the United States as a picture bride, and as a first uh, uh, husband, uh, she came here, and uh, and as a consequence, uh, they got married, and they had a little girl, and then uh, what happened is um, the. Uh, uh, the husband got sick and he says, I want to go 
back to Japan. So uh, he wanted his wife to come along. But my mother had uh, actually uh, refused to go back with him. Now, that would be kind of strange. But the reason why she didn't want to go back to Japan is the fact that in Japan, you know, at that time in the uh, early 19th century, uh, Japan was uh, a very poor country. It was just coming out of its uh, uh, feudalism and so on. And uh, the, her father, my, my mother's father, had gone to uh, Hawaii uh, to work. And then so it, when he went, uh, the uh, mother worked on the farm. And then, uh, and then my mother, uh, who, who was the eldest of uh, like uh, eight. eight children, uh, was the, became the mother at the age of uh, less than 10. Yeah, and she had to take care of the other siblings uh, in the farm. And, and it was very hard work to, to be uh, all the chores of the mother uh, at the age of, uh, let's say, eight or nine and, uh, and so on. So she she had a very hard uh, upbringing in in Japan, and so she didn't want to go back there. So, consequently, when her new husband in California said he wanted to go back because he was kind of ill, uh, she refused, and uh, she uh, div uh, s sort of uh, uh, they divorced. That's what happened, and uh, and then what did she do? She she took over the restaurant that they were uh, working and uh and then as a consequence uh she actually run the restaurant by herself for many years and and then uh it was right in front of the city hall in los angeles and uh business uh was good because there was a lot of people who came to the uh, to the city hall and you know after they they got through the business, they crossed the street, and there was this restaurant. They said, "Oh, let's get something to eat." And so, so they sort of like thrived on the on the business of these uh, people who came to the uh, government offices uh, in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, so, uh, when when the business got so good that uh, the, my mother said to her cook. He says, do you know anybody who can help us? Because, you know, we need somebody that uh, can help us more. And the cook says, you know, I have a brother in uh, Alaska. And then uh, I'll, I'll ask him if he wants to come back. Actually, uh, that, that uh, brother was my future father. And he had immigrated from Japan. And he had gone to Af Alaska to find gold. And of course, this was after the gold rush in Alaska, and so <clears throat> he was not able to uh, to uh, find anything. So he agreed to come down uh, to Los Angeles, and then uh, worked at the restaurant. And then pretty soon, the, they they I guess they fell in love, and they married, and so on. And so so uh, I was born before the war, right before the war. And, uh, I have a brother and a sister who was born before me. I'm the youngest of three people. And uh, so what happened is that in 1941 and 42, uh, you know, the war broke out. The 41, it broke out. But in 42, we had that order to move to... Uh, to uh, assembly center, and so what did we? What did the government uh, uh, say? Well, every person of Japanese descent, okay, had to come to this assembly center, okay, and you had to come with only two suitcases. That's the limit. So what did you do? If you had a restaurant, you had to have a fire sale. If you didn't have anybody come and buy your property or, uh, or take over the business, then you just left it there. And so as a consequence, uh, uh, with two suitcases, uh, we uh, went to uh, the assembly center. The assembly center uh, was 
the Santa Anita racetracks. And guess what? They cleaned out the racetrack of the horse manure. And that's this, this is where you're going to live for the next couple months because they're building some uh, buildings out in, in some areas of the um, uh, United States. And that's where uh, you're going to stay. And so we stayed in the horse stables for two months. And then at the end of two months, the buses came and we were told to get on the bus, okay, and then go to this new uh, center. Actually, uh, we did not go to, to Northern California first. We went all the way to Northern Wyoming. And uh, there was a place uh, that they, made uh, uh, a settlement of tar paper houses, very cheaply made out of uh, cheap pine wood and so on. And uh, this was uh, called Heart Mountain. That's one of about a, a dozen uh, re, uh, relocation centers that was usually found in very desolate areas of the United States and desert areas and so on. Each one of these places were, you know, places where nobody was around for miles and miles. And uh, the, the government says, this is where you're going to be located because you're Japanese. Not because you're, you did something wrong, it's because of your ancestor. We want to place you and protect you from, from uh, from the uh, people there and so on. When you went to the camps, the, 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 you, you noticed that that was a big lie because there were big barbed wire fences all around the camp that you couldn't get out. There were soldiers that were stationed there on, in big towers with rifles and live ammunition, searchlights. And then the rifles, instead of pointing outward, to protect against uh, anybody intruding, they were they were pointed towards the inside. Okay, now that's not protecting the people, you know. That's that's like incarceration, and this incarceration was due to the fact because of our racial background, and that's the only thing that that was the thing. There was no trial. No, nothing was, uh, was uh, uh, you know, uh, no uh, crime was committed, no sabotage was committed, and the whole thing was based on the, your background. If you were of a certain race, you had to go. And so uh, we went to one of the camps, and for people in Southern California, this is very hard because Wyoming, Upper Wyoming was a very desolate area. The summers were hot, okay, dust all over, there were big dust storms, I remember, and the, the winters were very, very cold, minus 30 degrees, and, uh, and, and the uh, barracks had no insulation. They were like 20 by 24 or 15 by 20. And so on. They and it was like a big barrack, like you know. And each barrack had you know five or six uh, uh, partitions. These partitions uh, separated the families, but there was very little privacy because the partitions didn't go all the way to the top, and they were made out of cheap pine wood with lots of knot holes in it that that actually came out, and you can see the next family next door, and so on. There were no plumbing, no toilets, no kitchen, and so on. There was a mess hall that you had to eat your lunch, your dinner, and your supper, uh, and your breakfast uh, in, in the mess hall. Uh, the, uh, the latrine or the, uh, the bathrooms were in the center of the camp and so on. So can you imagine if your family was, was relocated to something like this, and you had to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. You had to open the door in the freezing weather in the wintertime, go walk several blocks, 
until you find the public uh, uh, washroom in the middle and then and then uh, use that and so on. And uh, the mess hall, of course, uh, the children were separated from the uh, parents so that the children ate at one time and the parents ate at, at another time. They weren't together. And so as a consequence, there was very little sort of like control uh, that parents uh, had over their children's behavior because they were separated. Well, that was the camp life. Of course, by that time, the Japanese the sort of organized uh, and tried to make it more livable by, by, uh, by forming uh, all kinds of uh, social clubs and, and Boy Scouts and so on. And, and, okay. and uh, around uh, two years after we've been in, uh, in this uh, camp, which is uh, located in Wyoming, the government says, oh no, we have to now have a loyalty uh, 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 issue. And you have to sign this paper that you're loyal to the United States. And, uh, and, and what it involved was, it says that you will now renounce your Japanese citizenship if you, you know, sign below. And, and, and so on, and, uh, and uh, you are loyal to the United States. Well, did that give you citizenship to the, to, uh, to the country, to America? No, did not. Did you lose your Japanese citizenship when you uh, signed that sheet? Yes, you did. So a lot of the, uh, the people who were, you know, like the first generation East States, did not want to sign that. They said, this is ridiculous. If I sign this, I'm going to be a, 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 a citizen with no country and so on. And so uh, other people, you know, signed it, but uh, a lot of majority did not sign it. And so the government says, well, you're, you're not loyal to the America and so on. We have to send you uh, uh, okay. either back to Japan when the war ends and so on. So my father was one of those people that he refused to sign because he didn't want to, uh, you know, give up his Japanese citizenship. And of course, he would be stateless if, when, when that happened. So because of the fact that he didn't sign the loyalty oath, uh, we were sent to another camp after two years in Harp Mountain, Wyoming. And uh, we went to uh, uh, California, Northern California which is a desolate area right below the Oregon border. Very, uh, it was actually um, uh, a place where it was, um, well, it was, it was called Tula Lake. And the reason is it was actually um, a very unique place because of the fact that it once upon a time there was under the sea and there was a lot of shells in the soil and so on. There was a lot of irrigation ditches there too. So the last two years of the war we spent in Tula Lake, California. And uh, and of course, I'm I'm not saying everything was uh, bad uh, there because at my age, I was about four or five years old. You know, I I didn't know what what was going on. You know, you don't know that there was a, a yeah, war no, going no. on and so on. And uh, as a consequence, uh, people who were uh, older, uh, the second generation, they they suffered more than 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 I did because of the fact that they knew what 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 was happening, and they they sensed the loss of liberty just because of their background. Uh, uh, and so on, and and the fact that that they didn't commit any crime, and, and it was all due to uh, to injustice uh, given to them. And so, uh, uh, what happened is, uh, you know, a lot of the people I remember, uh, you know, uh, had uh, riots. The fact that that this was unfair, and so on, and so. Uh, there was uh, a number of uh, soldiers sometimes had to come in and actually stop these people from rioting because they were very, very unpleased by the fact that uh, how the government had treated them uh, 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 
during this time and so on. And then uh, they, they decided uh, that uh, at, towards the end of the war that, that there should be a draft uh, among young uh, Japanese Americans uh, who were able to, uh, to fight in the war. And so uh, at the beginning, especially in Tula Lake, where most of the people there were actually people who had uh, more resistance to the uh, relocation of, uh, of, of the Japanese Americans, there were more resistance. And so the, the riots were a little bit more harsh there than other camps where, where people were more uh, uh, accustomed I guess more, more Americanized and so on, and as a consequence, uh, uh, well, by the end of the uh, towards the middle of the war, the government actually recruited about oh I don't know six to eight thousand uh, Japanese Americans into the army, and they were able to uh, fight. Uh, well, so many of them went to, uh, to uh, join with the with the uh, with the unit from Hawaii, the 100th Battalion, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and then uh, they were trained in Mississippi and so on, and then uh, the uh, the one from the United States was was the 442nd uh, uh, yeah, Battalion that, and they they actually fought in in uh, Europe. And uh, they liberated a lot of the towns and in, uh, in Europe and so on. So, at the end of the war, they uh, they were given the hardest, uh, most difficult jobs uh, that uh, that was prevalent. Uh, especially this one incident in France, where for weeks and weeks, they, there was some Americans uh, soldiers from. Texas that was trapped uh, on a mountain uh, side and and they were surrounded by German uh, soldiers and they were going to be closed in and, and actually eliminated and then the, the orders were sent out to these uh, Nisei Japanese American soldiers to rescue them and through heavy casualty 60 percent of the of the cavity in 30 days the uh, the Nisei soldiers uh, traveled up the mountain and rescued these uh, these uh, th three hundred uh, Texas uh, soldiers uh, that were trapped in this uh, uh, area of France, and so uh, as a consequence, uh, you know they they there was heavy heavy casualty. They were given the most uh, uh, hardest uh, assignment. One incident that was noted is the there was a a group of uh, Japanese Americans that they actually went into uh, parts of Eastern Europe, and they were the first ones to liberate the uh, Jewish camps. And then, as they were almost to getting uh, uh, liberate the camps, uh, the the government says, "No, stop them! Stop them! We don't want photographs of uh, Asian soldiers uh, uh, rescuing and and uh, giving them publicity." So uh, they they were they said they stopped them. And then when the white soldiers uh, of other battalions came, they were able to uh, rescue uh, these Jews and so on. And uh, and so that showed that even during the war. The, uh, there was a lot of prejudice against publicity of uh, Asian uh, soldiers rescuing Jewish uh, uh, prisoners uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, and and so on. And uh, so, uh, of course, when uh, after the uh, after the war ended, my uh, father would be, was going to go to Japan, but. Uh, one of the things that happened is that my uncle was able to leave the camp a little early and he found a job in, Cal uh, in Chicago. And uh, he was working for a big hotel in Chicago and he says, he wrote to his brother, my father, uh, and that if you go to Japan, you're going to you regret it because it's all bombed out and, and so on. You're going to starve and so on. I want you to come and reconsider and come to Chicago. 
And so after many days of thinking about it, my father changed his mind and he says, well, we're going to go settle in Chicago. And so we took the train from California. We went, I guess we went to Portland. And then from Portland, we went to, uh, to Chicago. When in Chicago, of course, uh, uh, it was uh, much, it wasn't an easy place to be, especially during the war, there was a big movement, migration of, of uh, people from, from the South, especially black people who were, came up from the South to find jobs that was uh, in Chicago. And so housing was very, very tight. In fact, there was hardly any place to, uh, to, to be rented. And everything was really, really tight. There was no, no new houses during the war and, and all these people migrating to, to the industrial north and so on. And, uh, and so uh, my father was uh, lucky enough to find an abandoned house uh, in the side. The government, uh, before we left for Chicago, said one thing. They said, if you go to Chicago, don't speak Japanese. Don't live together in a, in a ghetto. I want you to separate into different smaller groups so that you, you lessen the discrimination and so on. Well, to the surprise of everybody, uh, the Japanese were accepted in Chicago much, much easier than, than California because they ne never had the history of uh, anti-Asian bigotry. And the bigotry in Chicago was a different kind of bigotry. There was, the bigotry was mainly black big, bigotry. And as a consequence, and as a consequence, what happened is, uh, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we bought the house, the, uh, the abandoned house, and we fixed it up, and we put plumbing in, and we put, the, uh, we put a heater in, and then my father, who was uh, about that time, I guess he was my over 55 or 60 years old, he was an old man already, because he had married late, and as a consequence, uh, you know, he, uh, he was able to fix that house and we, we were able to live there and thank goodness uh, uh, in that place. And we were, you know, I, I met very few prejudice uh, in Chicago. I went to elementary school, kids, kids I, I, I met very little prejudice, uh, but uh, the prejudice, like I said, was uh, mainly directed towards uh, black people. So it, because of the fact that uh, uh, of, of that, you know, the Asians, the Chicagoans didn't know about, you know, who were Asians and so on and, and so on. And so uh, I remember one time I was going to uh, shopping with my mother and there was a little black boy. He was uh, walking on the sidewalk and all of a sudden the shopkeeper starts spitting on him. I said, oh my gosh, what is this? And so on. Anytime a black person came and they moved into a, a white area and so on, uh, you know, there would be, they would be firebombed and so on. There was a lot of violence against that. When I went to high school, uh, well, mainly the, the neighborhood that we moved in was mostly Polish and Italian. And I did not have any prejudice. I mean, I can't remember any of my fellow classmates, you know, like saying snide remarks about uh, my background or anything. Uh, when I went to high school, we had to go a little further distance and so on. And one of the things I, that I noticed was the fact that white neighborhoods, there was 100% white, turned into 100% black within my time between the four years that I went to high school. It was such a, uh, what do you call, transition that there was like people were, were uh, what we call white flight. And, uh, and this was caused by real estate agents who, who would telephone 
white people and say, oh, listen, there's a black people coming into your neighborhood and they would, they, they're going to, uh, what do you call, you better sell your house or your house is going to be uh, worth nothing and so on. So, so uh, there was uh, a big scare tactic to remove them. And of course, it made money because the transaction resulted in money for the real estate agents and so on. And so uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, I saw the uh, whole neighborhoods that changed in, uh, in Chicago from white and so on. The factories moved to the suburbs and so on. And even today, you know, it's very hard because the black people uh, at that time did not have the ability to, to go from the center of the city to the suburb. Uh, and, and as a consequence, there was segregation, which even today exists uh, at, at that time. And so uh, that, that is something that I grew up with uh, in the Middle, middle West. And then, uh, uh, but people who of Japanese uh, uh, ancestor who went back to California and Oregon and Washington, it was a completely different story. The, the prejudice against uh, Japanese Americans were very, very high. And uh, as a consequence, there were all kinds of violence and so on. And uh, gradually, you know, subsided. But uh, it was much, much different. The atmosphere was much different. And of course, today, you know, things have, uh, calm down the mu a lot and and gradually we're becoming to accept uh, you know uh, the, the the us the us is including more and more people of different uh, of groups and so on and uh, first of all it was the anglo-saxons and then the uh, and then the northern europeans the scandinavians and the uh, germans and so on of protestant faith and then Finally, uh, you know, uh, then you had the Southern uh, uh, Europeans, the Eastern Europeans, and so on. Even today, the prejudice against certain groups were, uh, were present in the 1920s. Here, I live in uh, Long Island, and you know, you know the history of Long Island in the 1920s. There were open uh, uh, Ku Klux Klan meetings all over the uh, uh, the yeah, eastern uh, Long Island, and as a consequence, uh, they they were very resistant to immigrants uh, and uh, and Catholics moving out of the city. We don't want them. This is a Protestant area, and so on. But gradually, you know, as more and more people from the city came, you know, things slowly changed. But the thing is, it didn't disappear. I think today we have a latent still. Uh, atmosphere of white supremacy over thousands and, uh, of, of people all around the United States. So we have to be very vigilant as to, to uh, recognize that there is still this uh, idea of uh, manifest destiny, that this is uh, uh, a country of white people and not of different uh, uh, races and so on. And, they're very resistant to that. And, uh, but gradually, on the other hand, we're l learning on, to accept other people and other cultures and so on. So that's my story. And uh, I hope that, you know, that uh, my story uh, will be just part of American history and uh, that we can learn from it and that uh, education and and, uh, and urbanization and uh, integration will, will make people, you know, more accepting of other races and other people of different religions and so on. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that my students won't, you know, ha have a lot of uh, questions, especially about camp wise. So I would like to start first, um, asking you so uh, people who would like to ask questions you might actually type up your questions on uh in this chat box but i would like to start asking you 
about education in the camp. You know, what, what kind of school did you go and then who were your teachers and then what, what was the quality of um, education there? Well, it depends. I went yeah. to a Japanese school, that especially I started kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And these Japanese teachers from Hawaii and so on were very strict. I did not enjoy it at all. <laughs> but if you were more Americanized, and a lot of Americans were Americanized, you know, especially if they were, you know, like older Americans, they, they went to American schools. Yeah. And the teachers uh, in those schools were uh, people from the outside. There were a lot of yeah, Quaker, uh, Quaker uh, teachers that volunteered uh, to come to the camps and educate the people. And they influenced a lot of people. And yeah. to them, I guess the, uh, uh, the education was more uh, Americanized. Nice. But unfortunately, in my case, uh, I, uh, I just attended kindergarten and uh, <laughs> I did not like it because the, the, uh, the teachers were very strict. Uh, I remember that one time if, if a student did not know the answer, everybody would be punished, which was very <laughs> absurd. <laughs> and so <laughs> very strict, very yeah. uh, brutal uh, compared to Americanized uh, schools in other camps. Right, okay. Uh, the, the question from uh, Ms. Um, Janine Smith, uh, she wants to know about food food that was provided in the camp okay the food was uh well a lot of them were uh they weren't special food for japanese uh, a lot of them were uh, uh american food uh yeah. you know and uh some of them you know the japanese americans uh actually resisted because of the fact that uh they uh they never ate that kind of food before, you know, like macaroni, macaroni and cheese. cheese and so on. They never ate that kind of food. And, and, uh, but, you know, there was no starvation, okay? It's not, you cannot compare these camps with the, uh, the, the what do you call it, the Nazi camps in Europe. But, but still, a lot of the food that was uh, uh, provided in the mess halls was grown in the area. You know, because they were excellent farmers. Many of them were excellent farmers, and they they started, uh, you know, uh, farms around the camp, which was, you know, I guess you could do that if you have water, you know. And then a lot of the uh, food was also uh, gave, provided by the government. All right, you're still there. Yeah. Okay, so there is another question about um, medical care in the camp. Um, okay. Well, Medicare care depended upon uh, uh, what kind of case you had. If it was something that was treatable, there were doctors of Japanese uh, descent that would help you with that. But if it was something that was much more difficult, then you were sent outside the camp to, uh, you know, uh, white hospitals and so on. But if you had that done, you had to pay for that. Yeah, your brother had tonsils, yeah. remember? I remember my brother had tonsillitis, tonsillitis. and uh, he had to uh, get his tonsils out. out. And I was so envious because I asked him, well, what happened after you got the tonsils removed? He said, oh, they gave me ice cream. <laughs> and so uh, as a consequence, I said, oh, wow, <laughs> maybe I want my tonsils out too. <laughs> but anyhow, the, the <laughs> difficult cases, medical cases, they were they were let out uh, of the camp, but the but the ordinary uh, simple cases were treated by local uh, Japanese doctors and nurses that were you know uh, in the camp. Mm. Let's see. Baby was born the camp. Baby. Yeah, I had. Um. How do you, I mean, so um, there is this question about um, 
can you talk a little bit about how the camp that you were in w w was different from all other camps? You you had already talked a little bit about it, but uh, because this, yeah. Which which camp? I mean, I mean two two lake. Two I mean, lake. Not, not Heart Mountain, but the two lake was different. I mean, I mean, you can maybe compare two lake and and Heart Mountain because you were you were in both you know camps. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, what well, Heart Mountain was in a much more desolate area, and uh, it was like yes, very yeah. cold and so on. Uh, Tula Lake was a much more milder yeah, climate, and um, there was a lot of uh, things to do. I remember, I think I became a biologist because I saw so many things in the, in the ditches, the irrigation ditches that was so exciting. I think that, you know, people growing up in the camp, it was not all bad because I saw, you know, you had so much experiences of, uh, of catching, uh, uh, you know, fish and frogs and all oh, kinds so of, beauty, and, yes. and, uh, and then the women folks collected little shells from the mm -hmm. soil and they, they made all kinds of jewelry mm -hmm. from it and so on. So in, in that sense, uh, uh, the, the camp in uh, Tula Lake was uh, much more uh, uh, mild in terms of uh, climate and so on. But in terms of, of uh, people who were there, it was a little different because the people in Tula Lake were people who were much more, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Pro-Japanese. Uh, Pro-Japanese, yeah. that's right. Pro-Japanese, yeah. Pro much more resistant to the, and resentful of the fact that they lost their liberties just because of their background. And the fact that, you oh, know, they were given a raw deal uh, uh, because of the fact that, you know, other groups were, uh, you know, not treated the same. It was all due to one thing. There was no, no, not even one case of sabotage among the Japanese. Yeah, I remember that Recently, you know, they took off, took those books by Dr. Seuss off the market because they were like, yes. some of them were racially, uh, you know, uh, uh, provocative and so on. They, they, they uh, drew uh, people of Black and uh, Asian people in, in a much no, no, uh, a der derogatory manner. And one of the, the, the fact is that the Dr. Seuss, although he has his, his, uh, his uh, uh, attitude uh, changed drastically after the war, but during the war, he was so uh, very, very anti-Japanese, anti-Asian uh, uh, you know, and so on. And one of the cartoons that I noticed a couple of days ago, because they published a lot of the uh, cartoons that he made, was this cartoon which showed a whole line of people. And then uh, they were, they represented uh, the Japanese Americans that were in the camps, and, or, or in California, actually. And then, and then there was a, a booth in the, in the beginning of the line, and the, and then the person was giving out uh, dynamite, and they, uh, and it was showing that that the Japanese Americans in California was uh, was a very very strong threat that they would do all kinds of nasty things when 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 the war broke out. So it was very prejudicial, but you know that was wartime pro propaganda, you know. He regretted all of that, but he his rationale is at that time, you know, that was uh, that was how people thought. Even Earl Warren, like I said before, he became the chief justice, but his attitude after the war completely changed, and he became very liberal. But before then, when he was a attorney general in California, he was very very prejudiced. Um, you know, we had a, a, another talk before, um, I mean, you know, last week, and then uh, the speaker, Paul Tejada, who, who was, you know, around your age, he was just telling us, like, one thing that, that um, 
since you know there are many people who who knows very little about the, the uh, Japanese American camp experience, he has to tell uh, the, his audience that um, that it was. I mean, basically, Japanese American internment camps were not like where they like they you know like men and you know women and the men had to do something like you know slave labor. Um, could you talk a little bit about? The, it, it that that uh, I, I mean, some people have this image of Japanese American internment camps as uh, labor camps. Uh, yeah, well, I don't think so. they were forced labor, you know, but they were still, you know, the resentment was the fact that they didn't do any anything wrong. There was no crime permitted. The only reason that they were put in camps is because of their background. That's the only reason. And then, and that resentment actually, you know, caused a lot of distress. There was a lot of, uh, what do you call, trauma involved with moving, you know, especially older people moving from the, you know, where they were settled for years in California into someplace that was tremendously uh, hostile environment and so on. So, so mostly it wasn't physical uh, type of distress, but it was a mental distress. Yeah, and it that. sort of left a, a lot of Japanese Americans with a lot of trauma, which after the war, they, they just uh, yeah, couldn't get right. it out because they were so uh, traumatized by the experience that their government, uh, under which they live would do such a thing to them. Could you tell us, I mean, could, you know, um, if uh, Japanese Americans in the camp could work and then, the, you know, if they were oh, yeah. working, what kind of work they were doing? Well, they were working, especially like places like in Idaho and Oregon, Eastern Oregon. Uh, there were farms around there. And as, as the fact that many of the workers were drafted into the army, they were actually, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, they, were, they, they needed workers. And they asked the, the camp director, one of them happened to be uh, Dwight Eisenhower's brother, by the way, <laughs> to actually bring the soldier, um, these uh, camp workers, young men, to work on these uh, farms to harvest the, the, the crop. One of the most important crops in Oregon was sugar beets. Sugar was very, very important uh, in, uh, during World War II because it was uh, a source of, uh, of uh, 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 important chemicals for uh, ammunition and for sugar as uh, you know, a dietary uh, uh, factor and so on. And a lot of those uh, farmers were, uh, they said, well, unless we get uh, uh, more help to harvest these uh, crops, we have to, you know, destroy them and plow them under the soil. But uh, for, uh, by, by uh, cooperation between the camp directors and then the people who ran the farms, they were able to cooperate and then actually hire out these people in, into uh, 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 people who worked on the farms. So there was a lot of uh, uh, things that, uh, that were useful in that sense. That, uh, yeah. But there were, you know, were there pe but there were also people in the camp who were working in the kitchen, mess oh, yeah. homes and then yeah. an library, and then some of them are teachers. Firemen. They were policemen, uh, you know, and so they didn't have any weapons, but, uh, you know, they were people who uh, kept order and so on. And so, uh, you know, there was an organization that, that developed right there. It wasn't chaotic. In fact, a lot of them was very organized. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that uh, yeah, is uh, very so impressive yeah. about the camps that they were able to form schools and, you know, form Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and uh, they had you know, sports mother, and, so. and so on. Sports was very important in the camps because it relieved a lot of the tension that started developing uh, in the camp and so on. And, and by having rivalry between other uh, groups of uh, camp uh, uh, 
uh, people, they were able to release that tension. So that was a very important part of camp life. Yeah. And, and, then, uh, and then all those people who, who are working at, at uh, mess halls and, and, and as teachers and librarians, and then they get, you know, they, they will actually get paid, right? I mean, I'm sure yeah, that the, 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 the salary was very low, but but they very you know, low. But they yes, they money. were they were paid. It was uh, it wasn't something that was like slave labor or anything. Your no. father made soap. Yeah, my father was uh, one of the things that my father did is he collected fat. Yeah, because of from the kitchen, kitchen. He and he was it. able to make soap, laundry soap. Because he knew that the the reaction between what sodium hydroxide and soap, you know, causes the, it to gelify into soap, laundry soap, and yeah. uh, and so he he was able to make it. I don't know where he made it, but he made it and sold it to other people who were very pleased to have that soap. Yeah. and then people, you know, and and but a lot of people didn't have you know, like we didn't have a job. So many people ended up doing all sorts of um, interesting things and then hobbies and then gardening uh, and, oh, then yeah. and then uh, like even oh, like uh, musical, you know, uh, mu like playing some all sorts of musical instrument that then they, you know, uh, they brought or they, they bought um, through the mail oh, yeah. catalog. Sure. There was a lot of entertainers, uh, people who uh, actually were band leaders and so on. They, they had uh, movies and so on. So, you know, it's not, uh, it's not that... Uh, uh, organized. It was organized. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. Okay, so, so this, this is a very important question about... Um, can you talk a little bit about the apology from um, the United States government that came in 88 and, and uh, the reparation process? Well, after the war, I guess uh, the JACL was instrumental in trying to organize. I mean, we actually have a, a you know, person from JACL, so he, maybe I can introduce him. Before, you know, okay. after, but but can, you, can you talk a little bit about apology, reparation, and yeah. about what do you think about this? Well, they were given, uh, uh, well, the, the, um, the organization uh, known as the Japanese American Citizen League uh, wanted to, to uh, have some kind of, a, you know, apology because they found out that, you know, all of this is, was racially motivated. There was no need to uh, to incarcerate all these Japanese Americans, it was due to hysteria, war hysteria, and for racial discrimination and so on. They didn't do it to other uh, other groups. Of course, other uh, Germans and, and Italians were uh, were put into camps, but they were they were put in because they did things that were you know like uh, detrimental. Uh, in in terms of uh, you know uh, things, and it wasn't because of their background, and so on. In the case of Japanese American internment, it was just due to uh, to background uh, uh, that uh, they were guilty. But uh, during the 1980s, it was uh, uh, the Japanese Americans were able to uh, get the Congress to pass. Uh, the uh, restoration and the remuneration of uh, and an apology uh, for the action during the war. But even still, 40% of, I guess it was the House, still refused. You know, it wasn't 100%, it was 40% refused to, to give remuneration uh, to. Uh, Japanese Americans. I guess there was still a lot of hostilities. A lot of people says, "Oh yeah, but you got paid after the war." But what you got paid was very, very minimal. You know, the, uh, the loss of uh, property, the loss of not not including the indignities that that we suffered was uh, was no, much dead, though, was much. Uh, uh, minor, uh, well, major compared to the uh, 
to the fact that uh, that uh, there were billions of dollars of lost property, people who own farms, and restaurants, and so on. And, and uh, I remember my father had a bank account uh, in, uh, in a Japanese bank yeah. in California, the Yokohama Species Bank, oh, which yeah, is yeah, a that's... Japanese branch of a, a branch. And he had his savings in there. And then when the war broke out, the government uh, seized that and then frozen the assets of that. After the war, we got only, uh, well, the, the prevailing uh, uh, exchange was 25 yen to a dollar. After the war, we got some of the money back, but at the rate of 360 yen to a dollar. So we got pennies on the dollar uh, after. So we, we went through a lot of you know, financial uh, losses, even with the remuneration of $20,000 to uh, to uh, each Japanese citizen, but that twenty thousand dollars that we were given was not given to uh, people who had died. My parents never received that because they had they they were already deceased by then. This is in the nineteen eighties that this that happened, no and uh, as a consequence, uh, you know uh, uh, this. Uh, a lot of people think, that, oh yeah, you got money back from that, but really it was it was really like peanuts to uh, to what we oh, had won, lost during the war. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, many uh, Japanese Americans had lost uh, income because a lot of them were idle. Uh, although, you know, some people worked, but they were at, worked at really, really minimal wages. So that's, that's the yeah. thing. Okay. But the most important thing is the fact that the American government apologized for yeah. uh, giving us a, a, a letter of apology. Ronald Reagan who was the president at that time. He gave us an apology that, you know, this is something that, that shouldn't have happened and so on. Okay, so we, we have actually a um, uh, representative from Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, so if you could, George Hirose, if you could talk a little bit about the, the um, reparation and then the, the role that, that your organization, Japanese American Citizens League, uh, JCL, played in, um, in this, this process. And then you can uh, introduce the, the group. So maybe some people want to join. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi. Uh, yeah, I'm George Hirose. I'm uh, president of the New York chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, you know, Japanese American Citizens League was started in 1929, uh, and oh. you know, from a bunch oh. of grassroots organizations. And uh, you know, it's 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 a national organization. Uh, you know, 100 chapters, <laughs> people everywhere. Um, now, I just want to make it clear that, yeah, J, uh, JACL did help push through reparations, but there were a lot of other people involved, including the NCRR, a National Coalition for Repa uh, Redress and Reparations. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think what JACL was able to do is that they had people in place to be able to convince members of Congress to uh, kind of you know, the right avenues for successful uh, uh, redress and reparations, basically. Um, and there, we have a member, uh, Grant Ujifusa, who was very, very um, uh, savvy in getting right to Ronald Reagan to get him to pass this bill. So, you know, uh, Jane Hill does get credit, quite a bit of credit for redress and reparations, but it was a massive movement. And uh, in New York City, uh, you know, they, they uh, uh, reenacted, uh, uh, you know, did testimony and, and, and uh, you know, really got involved here. And there were a lot of people involved with it. Um, the, um, uh, you know, I'm, I just want to say I'm, I'm so deeply moved by your stories. Uh, I've heard a lot of them. Uh, each one is different. Uh, uh, each one is a uh, complete truth uh, in how people were treated. Um, and, uh, you know, I myself uh, don't have any ancestors that were incarcerated in, uh, on the, from the West Coast. Uh, but uh, I, you know, my, my family was here in the 1920s. And of course, because of uh, immigration laws and the Exclusion Act 1924, uh, they were not allowed to become citizens and were 
immediately arrested and deported. Um, they, they spent time, uh, they were in New York City and they spent time in uh, Homestead Prison in Virginia and then Greenbrier Prison in West Virginia and were considered enemy aliens and were used as hostage bait. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a whole nother story, the hostage ships that left from Pier F in, in Jersey City to go to Mozambique to meet a Japanese boat, returned to Japan, uh, total uh, traumatic for our family, you know, wow. on another level. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then my great, great uncle who was here went back to Japan and told my father that he needs to come to America. You know, he loved this country so much. And, and wanted to settle here. And he was getting old at that point, so he never made it back. So there's a lot of stories in New York, too. Uh, 2,500 people were rounded up, uh, you know, right after Pearl Harbor. Uh, up to uh, maybe 500, 500 people were actually held at Ellis Island for different points, uh, different periods of time. So there's a lot of persecution here, people under house arrest. Uh, and, um, you know, it was prevalent everywhere. Uh, but it's really interesting um, oh, to hear uh, your perspective on racism, because uh, I think it's really important not to isolate the Japanese experience from the history of racism in this country. Very, very important to remember that, that it, it's been, you know, since the beginning of, 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 uh, of the birth of this country and what we did to Native Americans and uh, continue to do to immigrants, you know, it's, it's uh, tragic. So uh, hopefully we're on the road to trying to rectify some of those things or make people accountable. So thank you, I mean, so much for your, your, your talk. Uh, I really, really am moved by everything you're saying and, and your awareness of, of, of you know, what's, what's happening globally and, you know, mm -hmm. the, bigger, the bigger picture. So um, uh, anyway, I, I don't know if there's anything I should, else I should say, but, uh, uh, you know, JACL is still committed fully to uh, human rights, uh, you know, uh, yes. uh, you know, beyond the Japanese American community, we do a lot of collaborations with other other organizations um, here in New York. You know, we we have really great collaborators and uh, collaborators in through for solidarity, um, uh, you know, which does a lot of uh, takes a very strong stance against uh, the treatment of immigrants. Uh, with um, you know various other groups, I'm also on the board of the Japanese American Association and um, a group that's called JAJA, which is Japanese Americans and Japanese in America. Uh, and so there's a, a tight knit community here of some sorts. Um, you know, we're all interested in uh, telling the story and, and fighting uh, you know, hatred and uh, violations of human rights uh, through the lens of the, the Japanese American experience. So, we, um, you know, and you, you were, yeah, you're, uh, you know, what you're saying is uh, really true to, to what, 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 we, what we feel. So we need to talk some more later. So okay. anyway. So, uh, um, yeah, I mean, one, one thing about it is a Japanese American group, which is an activist, you know, like which involved in a lot of political activism, activism is totally different from Japanese I mean that the, the group that that many Japanese people from Japan belong, you know belong to. Um, they they are much more conservative, um, and then they they don't really involved in um, activism. But um, so let's see. So I think we have to end. Um, but um, if people, you know, if those people who still want to talk to uh, Tom, I'm sure that that he or George, um, I'm sure he he you know he he doesn't mind staying you know next like ten. 15 minutes but yeah. why don't I you know why don't I just um, uh, give him a big hand and um, thank you so much Tom um, <coughs> just, uh, thank you. Um, yeah thank how about you know, formally um, um, be, uh, in this session okay again thank okay. you thank you